Hi and welcome to this revision lecture video in preparation for SAC 1. This first video will concentrate on tech rich questions in the form of multiple choice questions and my aim is to highlight common questions and more importantly common mistakes and focus on examiner's comments, um, show you ways that you can make the best use of your CAS calculator and my now infamous alarm bell will be making its appearance throughout to highlight things that you need to be careful of. A reminder that SAC 1 is being um, or is a test SAC and will cover work on functions from chapters 1 through to 4 in your textbook. The best thing about this revision being in a video format is that you can actually pause the video, not only to get a break from my voice, but to actually try the question yourself and then press play again and listen and see if you were correct or if you actually fell for one of the tricks that the examiners have put in the question and so forth. Um, hope it uh, helps and uh, if it does and if you get something out of it perhaps just press uh, like at the end of it and that would be a good indication um, for me on how many people that this video has actually helped. So let's uh, make a start with the first question. This one here is from 2007 as it says, question 5 and you'll notice the um, huge amount of students that actually got it wrong with only 36% that particular year getting this question right. So the first thing that uh, your mind should be thinking when you read this question and the key word is unique solution. So when you see unique solution and even other words like infinite solutions or no solutions that's a reminder that you're working with uh, matrix format and finding the determinant. So the first thing you should be doing is realizing that a unique solution occurs when the determinant is not equal to zero. So that's what you're actually trying to solve. So I can pick up my calculator and type in solve, as you can see, debt, you can simply type in DET without having to go through the menu to matrices. Type in your matrix not equal to zero and you're solving for M in this particular case. This is an example, however, where the question might be just as quick to actually do it by hand if you know that your determinant comes from m times m minus 12 times 3, so you end up with m squared minus 36 can't equal 0, so m squared can't equal 36, which means m can't equal plus or minus 6. So this is an example where doing it by hand is actually just as quick, if not quicker, than using your calculator. Once you've got that answer though, that it can't equal plus or minus 6, then you need to actually obviously find the correct answer. So between A or C and understanding the notation of what it is that you actually want. So in this particular case, we don't want it to be M6 or negative 6, so we actually want C, any real number except for those two values. Next question. Remember you can push, um, pause if you want to. The key thing here is that we're looking at a graph, y equals kx minus 3, intersecting another graph, x squared plus 8x, and two distinct points. So um, realising one is that they are intersecting, therefore the two functions, kx minus 3 and x squared plus 8x, have to actually equal each other if they intersect. But the other thing is that two distinct points in your mind should be ringing the discriminant. Discriminant tells you how many solutions or how many um, uh, distinct uh, solutions like points, whether they're x-intercepts if you're looking at just a parabola or points of intersection if you're trying to equate two functions. So understanding that we need to look at the discriminant. Intersecting, meaning that the two equations are actually equal. So on your calculator, I would be solving um, x squared plus 8x equals kx minus 3. It brings me to this uh, quadratic format. And then that's where you need to actually apply the discriminant rule and the fact that the discriminant has to be greater than 0 if you have two distinct solutions. So your next job is to actually solve the discriminant. Remember, you do need to know what the discriminant is, and it's b squared minus 4ac. So your b value is 8 minus k, your a value is just 1, and your c value being the 3. 
solving when that is actually greater than zero. 4K in your calculator gives you the two answers. Um, a very common thing that the examiners do do though is that they know what your calculator is going to give you, yet the answer that they put up here is your ABCD e answer is in a different format. So understanding that this is actually 2 times root 3 and 2 times 4, which is 8, and negative 2 times root 3 and negative 2 times negative 4, which is also 8. So being able to identify which answer actually corresponds to your calculator. Um, the answer, therefore, obviously has to be B, that we want to know that it's actually greater than 8 plus 2 root 3 or less than 8 minus 2 root 3. And remember, one way of actually dealing with a quadratic and knowing when it's greater than 0 is to actually visualise, you know, you have a positive quadratic, these are your two solutions that you've just worked out over here. And for it to be greater than zero, you actually want this part of the parabola and this part of the parabola. Hence, B is the correct answer. Uh, surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, the most incorrect answer was actually D. So they had the same values, but what the answer was saying is that they were giving this part here that was underneath the x-axis. So they actually gave the answer for when it was less than zero. So um, be aware of that and please don't be the one making that mistake. Next question um, was a very well done question. 95% of the cohort that particular year got this correct. So uh, you certainly don't want to be in that 5% that gets it wrong. Um, and this one's just working on our transformations. So reflections, dilations, translations and being able to identify those transformations and what makes the new rule if we apply those, <coughs> excuse me, those transformations. So the first thing is that we have a reflection in the x-axis. So we know that if we put that negative sign in front of the rule, then we reflect in the x-axis. We have a translation of three units to the right. And remember, our left-right movement is always opposite when we put it inside the bracket. So if we're going to the right, it should be minus three inside the bracket. And the next thing that's happening is that we have four units translated uh, downwards, which is in the negative y direction, and we leave that as it is. So there should be a minus four at the end of the rule. So trying to find which of these rules give us those three things. So if that's my original rule, I am looking for a negative in front of that three, uh, which straight away eliminates E and A. <clears throat> I am looking for an X minus three inside the bracket. So that brings me to B at this stage because nothing else sort of has a minus three and I'm looking for the minus four at the end. So B is my correct answer. This question from 2008 was actually the best answered question on the whole exam paper with 93% getting it correct. Um, and as before, you know, you certainly don't want to be part of that 7% that give away a mark for such a basic question. Um, knowing that it's an absolute value function, you should obviously rely on the fact that the absolute value function basic graph has got a cusp at 0, 0. So now the cusp is at negative 2, negative 2. So we've gone two units to the left and two units down. So look for those translations in your um, options. And the only two that have minus two at the end to bring us two units down are C and D. So we can eliminate these three straight away. And then movement to the left comes from X plus two because we go the opposite direction. Um, so C is our answer. If uh, you want to check, you can put these two points in when x equals 0 and x equals negative 4 and you'll get that the y value is 0 in both occasions. Okay, next is another example of um, infinitely many solutions, just like no solutions and unique solution. Um, and 2008 they asked it again because it was so poorly done the year before and again only 45% got it correct. Um, and that's actually quite common. So if an exam question is not very well done, the examiners tend to re-ask it um, until the students get the hint that this is something that they need to know and understand. So infinitely many solutions. The first thing you should be thinking of is that I need to work with my determinant. 
So solve the determinant is actually equal to zero in this case. Um, and my calculator gives me negative three and two. But when it's equal to zero, remember it can be either infinitely many solutions or no solutions. And so what you must do is actually substitute these values back in to the two equations to see whether you end up with exactly the same line or whether you end up with parallel lines that have a different y-intercept. Um, so that's what you need to do. So you can do that on your calculator or you can do it by hand, it's up to you. But if I put negative three back into um, where A is in these equations and solve for Y, the calculator rearranges the equation for me. So you can see there that I have Y equals X and Y equals X, which is exactly the same line. So that gives me infinite solutions, but I do need to test the other one as well. So put two into my um, equations and do the same thing, solve for y. Calculator rearranges for me. And in this particular question, I actually get the same line again, negative two x over three both times. And so both values, a equals negative three and a equals two, provide me with infinite solutions. So what I'm looking for is a has to be negative three and two so the answer therefore has to be b so understanding that is these two numbers are the ones you actually want this one is saying any real number except for those two values so um, making sure you know how to read the notation given um, the amount of questions that we've done like this in class hopefully you're uh, not in that 40 or sorry you're in that 45% and you're well and truly above it. Next question is an inverse question. So we all know that to find an inverse graph, we swap our X and Y values and solve for Y. 89% um, got it correct this particular year. And the reason it was so high was it was actually a nice straightforward question because in actual fact, the given domain didn't actually um, make a difference in the answers. So let's have a look what we would do. Being tech rich, I would pick up my calculator and I know that I have to swap X and Y. So where Y is, I'd put X and where X is, I would put Y and solve for Y. And the calculator gives me this rule, one over X plus three all squared. And when I look at my five options, there's only one that has that as the rule and that's D. So that is the only answer. If there were two options with the same rule, then I would need to look at the actual domain and make sure that I choose the correct answer that has the correct domain that goes with it. Remembering that your domain of your inverse is actually the range of your original graph. Um, and that's what I'm just trying to say there is to be careful of restricted domains. Um, but in this case, D was our only um, option. Okay, this one here, looking at maximal domains um, and knowing that or where your asymptotes are. So what we're saying here is that this here is the maximal domain. So we don't have any restrictions other than when the function is not defined. Um, and we want to know our asymptotes. The x asymptote or the vertical asymptote, we can read off straight away. We should know that it's when x equals two. So really, I can eliminate these first three instantly. But what I need to work out is if these are both x equals two, I need to know my horizontal asymptote. And in this format, that's um, not obvious. So using your calculator, you can do that quickly by going into prop frac, which makes the calculator do the work for you in terms of converting it to a proper fraction, which is what we do when, it, when we do our long division process or our division of polynomials. Um, so going into prop frac onto your calculator, um, it rearranges and gives you the same hyperbola function, but in the format that you're used to seeing your uh, vertical asymptote and this number here obviously being your horizontal asymptote. So once you've got it in that format, then hopefully it's easy to see that D is our actual answer. And that was actually a well answered question um, that particular year. Here we go, we've seen the very best with a 93% and now this is the very worst in that particular year. And it was a transformation question, but using matrices. So being able to 
find the new rule given the actual transformations that are occurring in this matrix format. Um, because it's a, a calculator question, the calculator doesn't necessarily help you too much in this particular question. It is knowing that this is a dilation of 4 from the y-axis, this is a reflection in the x-axis and a dilation of factor 2 from the x-axis and here are your horizontal and vertical translations. That is what's going on in this question but actually working it out, remember we've looked at um, forming our actual equation, so doing our multiplication which is this row times this column, so 4 times x plus 0 times y and then plus the 1 gives me this equation here. Uh, rearranging that to get x on its own brings us to this next step here. Do the same, this row times this column, so 0 times x plus negative 2 times y plus 3 gives me this equation and then rearrange it to get y on its own here. So all the working up until this point is just to get our values of x and y from multiplying the matrices out. Substitute now your x and y values into the equation given. So everywhere there's a y, we're now going to put y dash minus 3 over negative 2. A reminder that y dash and x dash just stand for our new um, transformed values of x and y, the, the actual new image that's going to come as a result of the transformations. And then put our x value um, into the bracket and cubed. There's no need to expand all these brackets but you do need to do some sort of working because you need to find one of these answers that corresponds to your working. So multiply through by the negative 2 then add the 3 and that's this point here but that's not actually one of the answers. And so what you're looking for is to say, okay, well, what's going on here? That is x minus 1 all cubed over 4 also raised to the power of 3. And 4 raised to the power of 3 is actually 64. So being able to identify, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it is 64, but then cancels off with the 2 to give you the 32 on the bottom line. So A is actually your answer. And remember with your final step, the y dash and the x dash, um, can just disappear to give you the new rule. So I suppose the hardest thing there is being able to work with your working and know that that 4 was also raised to the power of 3 and then cancelled off with this 2 here. So some basic algebra skills needed to solve that question. Okay, this one's another example of an inverse function um, but it's more like being able to understand that um, the inverse function will exist if the original function is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So what it's asking for is this is my function but I need to know this domain here in order for the inverse function to exist. So what I'm looking for is a domain for which this function has a one-to-one -one correspondence. So very quickly you can on your calculator sketch the graph. This is one I suppose the um, safe ways of doing the question so you're not making or assuming um, one of the errors. <coughs> Excuse me. So once you've sketched the graph, find these key points, so your local minimum and your local maximum using your calculator. And then you can see that the graph actually has three parts where it's one to one. It has negative infinity up to this local maximum, which happens when x is negative a half, but that's not one of my answers because this is negative infinity up to positive a half um, and this one is negative infinity up to positive a half not included. So that's not that, that's negative a half. So it can't be those two answers. The next part where it's a one to one is from zero to positive infinity and that's not an option either. And so the next part where it's one to one is negative a half up to zero. And what threw students this particular year is that negative a half up to zero is not an option either. So it can't be this because that includes both the blue section and the purple section. Um, and it can't be uh, uh, um, A, sorry, because that's all three sections. 
This one here, answer B, is not one of my key points, but when x is positive a half, I'm about here, up to positive infinity. So that is a one-to-one. -one. So B is actually the correct answer, even though it's not the whole section where it is one-to-one. -one. But what's um, going on in this question is that if B was half to infinity, there would be an inverse function. So examiners um, succeeded, I suppose, in this particular year at the expense of quite a few students because only 50% got it correct because they picked a section of the graph that was not the whole section from where the key points were, were occurring. So be aware of that, um, that you're just looking for where is this graph one-to-one. -one. Okay. Here we go again, 2009. So I think this is now three years in a row they've asked a question that has to do with the determinant being equal to zero or not equal to zero and still only 49% of the cohort got it correct. So you're talking about thousands and thousands of students because I think we're up to around about 22,000 kids that do maths methods. Um, so, you know, when we say, you know, 50%, we're talking about 11,000 odd students getting it wrong. Um, <clears throat> so this is an opportunity for you by getting a question like this correct that you're just one step ahead of thousands of other students. So as you perhaps we've already seen, find your um, determinant. I'm just highlighting again that it's three years in a row there. Solve your determinant when it's not equal to zero and the answer gives you negative five and three. So you're saying basically it can be anything except for those two answers. So the correct response is B. The range of a function. The range of a function is not a difficult question. Um, the thing that students sometimes uh, make the error of doing is just looking at endpoints or um, not taking into account the shape of the graph. So you have a calculator, so there's no excuse for um, getting something like this wrong. You can just jump on, sketch it on your calculator. And obviously the range, you're looking for the lowest point up to the maximum point. So from three inclusive, because that is that cusp point on this absolute value graph, and up to infinity. So A is the correct answer there. Um, 2010, again, infinitely many solutions. Uh, I don't need to go through it now. I'm pretty sure you've probably got it correct, but uh, notice still no improvement, still around the 40%, 47% got it correct. So infinitely many solutions, the determinant has to equal zero. Find those values, in which case we have negative two and six. Um, but substitute them back in, so test when m equals negative 2, what happens? Uh, we get the same gradient, so we get 3 over 5 and 15 over 25, which is the same, but we get a different y-intercept, 7 over 5 and 7 over 25. So that tells us that those lines are actually parallel lines when m equals negative 2, which actually means no solution, so that's not the answer. Test when m equals 6, put it back in, we get exactly the same line, so same gradient and the same y-intercept. So our answer is actually d when m equals 6. Um, I don't think I've got the statistics, but I can be pretty much guaranteed that uh, some people might have put in a because they, oh no, not a, no. If I was the examiner writing this question, I would have actually had one of the answers as both of these, negative 2 and negative 6, because a lot of kids would have got to this step and then not actually tested the values. Um, this is an inverse function, and again, we want to find this value of a for the inverse to exist. So we're looking where is it a one-to-one, -one. so it's similar to a couple of years before that. 2008. Uh, draw the graph again, these are your key points. So find those using your calculator. Have a look where it's one to one. I actually don't need to test this one or this one because it's starting from negative infinity up to a particular value. So negative infinity is on this side. So looking at this yellow section of the graph, 
this point happens at 0, 3, so it's negative infinity up to 0, and I will have a 1 to 1 function. So the answer is a Ah, midpoint, 2011, a giveaway mark I've put there, yet still 14% got it wrong. And then it reappeared, uh, I think the year before last, um, as just basic assumed knowledge that students remember those formulas that you've learnt in Chapter 2, you know, distance formula, midpoint formula, uh, gradients of lines, perpendicular gradients, all that sort of stuff is all assumed knowledge. So very simple question, um, but probably just threw a few kids because they thought or didn't actually revise that sort of stuff. Um, so it's just obviously add your two x values divide by two, add your two y values divide by two. So the answer there is A. This one here again, very basic, uh, yet surprisingly only 56% got it correct. And the gradient of a line perpendicular to the line going through those two points. So the fact that it's perpendicular, you should be using the concept, I suppose, that m1 times m2 has to equal negative 1. So you do need to find the gradient first of the two points, and we get negative 2. And therefore, the perpendicular gradient is negative 1 over negative 2, which is a half. Um, Notice, or just as a point of interest, 20% actually answered C. So they got the concept that there was a negative involved, but they didn't actually flip or do a you know, negative one over the actual gradient. Um, so M2, the perpendicular gradient, is positive a half, but then you actually still had to find the equation of the line. Oh, no, you didn't. Sorry, you just wanted the gradient. It's even uh, simpler. So that 56% is actually really surprising. This one here relies on you knowing what the factor theorem is. And the moment you're told that something is a factor, you should know that when you put or divide by that, you get a remainder of zero. So in other words, um, if x plus a is a factor, then that tells me that, um, oops, sorry, not sure what I did there, that P of A, or negative A, has to equal zero. So when I put negative A in here, I should get zero as my answer, and then you can solve for A. So you can use your calculator, or you can do it by hand. So P of negative A has to equal zero, comma A, because I'm solving for A, and my calculator gives me the answer. You do need to, though, realise that here the domain is saying any real number except for zero. So this one here is not an option. So you're just looking at negative three, which is answer B. Okay, this one's an interesting one because you can actually make use of your calculator um, with the restricted domain given. Finding an inverse rule, A, D and E all have the same rule but different domains. So if you just went in and solved on your calculator, solve x equals square root of 2y minus 4 for y, the calculator would give you the rule, this one here, so A, D and E. But what you would have to work out is, well, which of these domains are the correct domains. So making use of your calculator, if you actually define your function with the restricted domain as part of your defining process, then when you do the inverse rule, it actually gives you the domain of your inverse. I'll show you what I mean. So if I define g of x as the rule and then put in the restricted domain, so the fact that it has to be between two and infinity, as part of my defining line, so up to this point, then solve for the inverse. So I'm solving x equals g of y, which is the way the calculator reads, swap x and y, and then solve for y, so comma y. It gives me the rule of the inverse, but it also tells me this very important piece of information. 
and that's x is greater than or equal to 0. So looking at those three options, x greater than or equal to 0 is answer D. So there's a um, neat little trick that your calculator, making use of your CAS calculator to help you rather than trying to work through, you know, if this is my domain of the original becomes the range of the inverse and what's the range of this one between this domain and, and doing it all by hand, your calculator can do it in one or two steps. Okay, this question is uh, addition of two functions and I suppose it draws on the fact that Firstly, if we're going to add f of x and g of x together, then that's only defined for the intersection of the two domains. So in this case, any real number and this domain, the intersection is just 3 on 2 up to 5. So that's important to remember that concept. But then what we want to know is what's the domain of the inverse function of this function h. Now remember domain of the inverse function is equal to the range of the original function. So if we know the range of this function then that's the, actually the answer that we're looking for. I don't need to find the inverse rule or anything like that because I'm only asked for the domain of the inverse function. So knowing that this h of x is um, f of x which is this part here plus g of x and there's my domain which is the intersection of the two domains. Once I've got that, I didn't have to define it, I just find it easier to define it there. I can go into my graphing window and I don't need to type in the whole rule because I've defined it. I can just type in h of x <coughs> and because I actually defined it with the domain the graph is only drawn between those two values okay and the, the calculator doesn't do this I've done this for the slide itself but because that's not equal to at this end there is an open circle so 5 is not included and the 3 on 2 is included so there is a dark circle so when you're looking for the range of this we're going from that value there which is 0.75 you can use that or use your calculator to find the minimum value up to 13 not included because it's an open circle and so the range of this function as I said before is the domain of my inverse so the answer that we need is D most common incorrect answer was E and that simply was that students confused the 3 on 2 from the domain here. They managed to get 13 by substituting 5 in but they did a careless mistake of actually just using 3 on 2 the x value rather than working out the corresponding y value. This one the most common mistake here uh, comes from the students that don't draw the graph and they simply put negative 2 into the rule, then they put 3 into the rule and they get their two endpoints and they think that's the range. But being a parabola, we all know that there is actually a turning point as well. So it's not just the endpoint here and the endpoint here because the graph goes all the way down to here. So knowing that it's actually negative 9 up to 0 which is the D answer. The most common mistake would have been this one negative 5 up to 0. Okay so please um, knowing that it's a parabola a quick sketch for a range function you shouldn't be getting something so easy incorrect. Okay, yet yeah, look, 31% did. So, and that's just time, the pressure of time. Kids are doing it quickly. They just check the endpoints and they forget that there is actually a turning point involved. Oh, there's my alarm bell just reminding you of that because it's a very common mistake. So um, please don't make it. 
a little um, quick sketch is the correct thing to do. 2012, um, we saw the reappearance of the no solution. And there's my little sad face because students are still getting it wrong. Only 43% got it correct that year. Um, so it's quite frustrating um, as a teacher or as an examiner that students are still not getting this concept correct. So no solution, you're finding when does the determinant equal zero. Test it, put it back in, see if you get the same line or parallel lines. And you're looking for parallel lines. So when m equals negative 3, we get the different lines, same gradient, gradient of 1, but a different y-intercept. So I do have parallel lines. So that is an answer. But test the next one as well. So when m equals 1, what happens? Again, the gradient here is a negative 1 over 3. And the gradient of this one is a negative 1 over 3. The y-intercept is a positive 1 over 3 and a positive 1 over 3. So I get the same line here, which was actually infinite solutions. So I don't want that one. So my only answer is m equals negative 3, which is b. Okay, that brings us to the end of the multiple choice questions and the revision of the tech-rich style um, questions that we can ask in your first SAC. Hopefully looking at past exam questions has been helpful and highlighting the you know, common mistakes, what the examiners are doing to sort of try and trick you up in some of the questions. Um, hopefully you've picked up on some uh, shortcuts, I suppose, in terms of making use of your CAS calculator um, for these types of questions. Um, as I said at the start of the video, if you did find something helpful and it helped your revision, um, perhaps just click the like button at the end um, if you didn't really get much out of it, then perhaps click the dislike button. Hopefully there's not too many of those. Um, good luck with your revision um, for your first sack and I'll see you at school soon. Bye for now.